Wonderful. Well, well, thank you very much, Julio, for, for laying out uh, the parameters of our event today. Uh, let me welcome you all. It's really great to see participants here from our own university, but also from the greater Chicago area university network, the energy scene, government labs, international organizations. Uh, so what I'd like to do is, since this is Northwestern's very first event focused on microgrids for sustainable development, what I hope to do was just give you a very brief overview, overview of why we think uh, microgrids are a key solution when it comes to sustainable development and what you can expect out of the program today. So let's start with some basic definitions. So there are numerous definitions out there for what constitutes a microgrid. I think Chris Marnay, our first scene setting speaker, will be talking a bit more about the de various definitions and components that comprise uh, a microgrid. But here's one that's pretty intuitive coming from the US Department of Energy. And it's really meant to just put us all on the same page for conceptually what we're talking about. So a microgrid is a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources within clearly defined electrical boundaries that can act as a single controllable ent entity with respect to the grid. And what you see here in this figure, this is a nice figure I borrowed from Berkeley Lab, one of the pioneering groups out there when it comes to microgrids. It shows microgrids can rely on various energy sources, both renewable and, and fossil-based. And uh, clearly, a lot of microgrid projects to date have relied exclusively on fossil fuels, and even many renewable projects rely on fossil fuels as an important source of backup. But there's a diversity of fuel mixes that are possible. Energy storage is typically necessary. And a microgrid can connect and disconnect from the grid to enable it to operate in both grid-connected and islanded modes. Uh, so this also holds for many of the successful microgrid projects around the world. We're also going to consider microgrids that are remote or rural microgrids that are operating consistently in, in island fashion. So that's, this is a basic idea of what we mean by microgrids. And we can explore the various nuances through our technical program today. So what do we mean by sustainable development? As many definitions as there are for microgrids, there are many, many more definitions that have been put forward over the years to capture this somewhat nebulous concept of sustainable development. So for our purposes, we're going to consider the UN's sustainable development goals, which you see pictured here. Uh, so in 2015, the, the UN uh, sort of codified these goals, and they encompass a wide range of, of aspects related to sustainable development. Poverty eradication, nutrition, uh, income disparities, industrialization and so forth, and clearly energy plays a big role when it comes to sustainable development. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't click, so here we go. Take a moment to absorb that. I'm looking at notes and you and not the screen, I apologize. Uh, and really the overarching goal of the sustainable development goals is by 2030 to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure prosperity for all. So very lofty but much needed goals and the real benefit to having these goals is they provide a way to track progress over time to see if different countries are on track uh, with respect to different goals in a measurable way. And it's really clear, I think probably to everyone in this room, uh, that clean energy is really critical when it comes to sustainable development but also economic growth. So when it comes to climate change, the energy sector is still the largest uh, sector when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, responsible for around two thirds of the global total. Around 1 billion people, 1.1 billion people, still lack access to electricity, and many millions more lack access to reliable electricity that they can depend on around the world that has clear implications for quality of life, access to basic energy services. Around 2.7 billion people lack access to clean cooking, uh, and the energy sector is the largest source of air pollution, both indoor, coming from our power plants and tailpipes, and also uh, so outdoor uh, air pollution coming from our, our power plants and tailpipes, but also indoor air pollution primarily related to uh, fuels such as charcoal or coal or wood being burned indoors for heat and or cooking, leading to a lot of respiratory issues, Two point, uh, uh, 6.5 million premature deaths every year. So the opportunity space is large for clean energy, and that's why the uh, UN development goals uh, include a, a, an explicit goal related to affordable and clean energy. This is sustainable development goal number seven. It has several targets. Some of the ones that are more relevant for our discussions today include by 2030, ensuring universal access to affordable, reliable, modern energy services. And by modern, what that means is no longer relying on traditional forms of biomass, for example, that people have to scavenge for cooking or heating. 
By 2030, increasing substantially the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix, and by 2030, doubling the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency. While we'll talk mostly about microgrid technologies, uh, the energy sources, the control algorithms, the, the storage technologies, and the challenges associated with those, it's critical to keep in mind that any a uh, viable microgrid absolutely has to be tightly integrated with the way energy is used, and, and efficiency plays a really big role for stable, reliable, low-cost microgrids. And really the goal of the symposium is to answer this, this big question. What role can renewable microgrids play in bringing affordable and clean energy to all? And more specifically, are there technology, policy, cultural barriers, uh, economic barriers that we need to overcome to accelerate the deployment of renewable microgrids when it comes to accelerating developments uh, in some of the, the world's regions uh, that have really pressing development needs. So let's take a quick stock uh, of, of where human development stands uh, globally uh, so we can have a little bit more uh, precise discussions moving forward. So what you see here is uh, a map of the so-called Human Development Index as of 2016, where the color codes correspond to low, medium, high, and very high levels of development. For those of you not familiar with the, with the HDI, it, it's a proxy metric for development, but it's not, it's not all encompassing. It's very difficult to devise a single indicator that captures all important dimensions of development. What the HDI captures is uh, a, a reasonable quality of life as measured by economic productivity and GDP, access to education, and then also uh, longevity, which is a proxy for access to health care, nutrition, clean water, clean air, and so forth. So what we can see here is a pretty stark divide between the most developed regions of the world, uh, Europe, the United States, uh, Australia, and so forth and the least developed areas of the world, those with low to medium uh, HDI values. And those are primarily concentrated in Africa, specifically Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Indian subcon subcontinent, as well as Southeast Asia. Uh, and this is where there's uh, quite a bit of, uh, of the world's population presently. And as I'll show in a few slides, that's where most of the population growth will be occurring in the coming decades. So these are the regions that are in greatest need of, of technologi technological progress and energy access uh, when it comes to sustainable development. And it's also clear that electricity plays a really pivotal role. Why is electricity important? As you can probably imagine, uh, it provides lights for general household tasks or students studying at night after the sun goes down. It allows for refrigeration to keep food fresh. It allows for access to the internet and computers, uh, giving access to information and all the benefits that connectivity, connectivity brings uh, to our lives. And it also relates to a cleaner form of fuel for cooking uh, and the reduction of indoor air pollution. So what you see here are data that I took from the IEA's Energy Access Portal, uh, just hot off the presses this morning, showing this, the, the proportion of population with access to electricity in 2016. The countries that don't have any color at all are fully electrified. It's mostly the developing and emerging economies where lack of access to electricity is still a very critical problem, particularly, again, in sub-Saharan Africa, the in Indian subcontinent, and so forth. And if we drill down into the need for cleaner fuels for cooking, clearly electricity is one potential uh, fuel uh, that could meet the, the needs for, for energy for cooking, zero emissions on site from energy. Uh, but also when we think of clean fuels for cooking, we have to think of natural gas or solar energy and so forth. So electricity isn't the sole source to address this problem. The point here is that it's a pressing problem in many parts of uh, those same world regions, uh, the proportion of the population with uh, a reliance on clean cooking already is quite low, and that's another important opportunity space for providing clean electricity through microgrids. All right. So there's also another elephant in the room that, that needs discussion, and that has to do with, with carbon dioxide emissions and climate change. So there's been somewhat of an intractable problem uh, that's occurred uh, in the development and in the history of human development, whereas the most developed countries have largely relied on fossil fuels to ensure high quality of life and, uh, and high level of, of critical energy services. And if we compare where countries are today, well, as of 2013, the latest data, uh, the latest year for which we have data, we can see that countries that are grouped into the low HDI uh, uh, category have very low per capita CO2 emissions. As development rises and we get into the medium development category, CO2 per capita emissions rise as well uh, by a factor of four. 
High development countries uh, have a factor of nearly 12 or more than 12 uh, compared to low HDI countries. And then we get into the very high uh, development group, which includes most of the developed world. There we have per capita CO2 emissions that are over 20 times as high as uh, the low HDI group. So what's the important implication here? Why are we talking about it? When we increase HDI, we increase access to, one way we get there is by increasing energy access. If we don't do so in a low carbon, clean way, uh, it's going to be very difficult difficult to break this historical trend uh, that relates very strongly CO2 emissions to development. But renewable microgrids could be one solution that helps us sort of break, uh, decouple growth from CO2 emissions. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, most of the population growth that's occurring or projected to occur through 2050 is going to be in those countries uh, which have the most pressing development needs presently. So on the left, you see total uh, world population. We're at a little over 7 billion people worldwide presently. Uh, projections from the United Nations are that by 2050, we'll add another 2.2 or 2.3 billion people to the planet, have a po global population of greater than 9 billion people. And if you look to the, the country level or regional breakdowns on the right, you can see that most of that growth isn't occurring uh, in the OECD, highly developed countries, or even in China. It's occurring in, it will occur in India. It will occur in Africa, uh, particularly sub-Saharan Africa. It will occur in other countries not uh, uh, classified as OECD countries. Uh, so we have a real time challenge as well. Uh, it's a pressing issue, and uh, population is growing in the places where development challenges are the greatest. How can microgrids play? The other important takeaway from this graph is that uh, most of the growth occurring around the world and projected to occur will occur in urban areas. So even though many of us may think of microgrids as a primarily rural electrification solution operating in island fashion, we have to resist the temptation to think of them only as solutions for rural energy access. The reality is that a lot of pressing development needs are occurring in the world's urban areas, and microgrids can play an equally important role in dense urban areas when it comes to sustainable development. And the current share of renewable energy uh, that we see here in this graph as of 2015 is still quite low in most parts of the world outside of, you know, the exemplary Scandinavian countries. Uh, but there's a nice overlay uh, between the potential for greater utilization of renewables and where the development challenge is most concentrated. And that sets the stage for the topic of discussion today. Renewable energy technologies for sustainable development vis-a-vis -vis microgrids. Uh, the good news is that, as many of you may know, the cost of clean energy technologies continues to fall. Here are some data from the U.S. Department of Energy. These are somewhat old already, but uh, if I had more recent data, we'd see an even starker uh, trend uh, towards lower cost and greater adoption. What you see here on the left are uh, index cost reductions, uh, so baseline costs in 2018 for six key types of energy technologies land-based wind, LEDs, utility and distributed PV, uh, energy storage with respect to batteries. Uh, costs have been coming down quite drastically due to continuously strong investments in innovation on the parts of governments, but really strong investment from the private sector, leading to economies of scale, cost reductions over time, leading to more market uptake. These trends are continuing, which bodes well for the potential cost viability of PV, of wind, of distributed storage technologies for microgrids. So the cost of renewables are falling and, and deployment of microgrids uh, in parallel continues to rise. So these are data from Navigant Research uh, who's been tracking uh, microgrid development since around 2009. Uh, here are data from 2012 showing the total global installed capacity of microgrids, both grid-tied and remote was uh, around three gigawatts in 2012. Just four years later, uh, the increase was about fivefold. So in, in the year 2016, over 16 gigawatts of microgrid capacity was installed around the world. Uh, and uh, even in the last year, for which data are available, there was a 25% growth uh, between 2016 and 2017. So there's a clear trend towards greater adoption of microgrids uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, there's also a trend towards increasing penetration of solar energy as the primary energy source for those microgrids. In 2016, there was about two gigawatts of total installed capacity, or about 12% of overall capacity attributable to solar. Uh, that increased by about, I think, 800 megawatts 
uh, between 2016 and 2017, uh, and raising the percentage of contribution to around 13 or 14 percent. So solar is already playing uh, a key role in microgrids, albeit still a small one. The other important point to take away is that microgrids, uh, with respect to their overall capacity, 20 gigawatts today, still only represent less than one, much less than 1% of overall global capacity, which is around 6,000 uh, gigawatts globally. So while microgrids can play an important role in fueling sustainable development, they're certainly not the only solution. They'll certainly never provide 100% of the clean energy access that's needed for sustainable development, but they're an increasingly viable solution. And I forgot to click the button, but you can see here that uh, uh, there are roughly 1,900, 1,800, 1,900 projects uh, in the Navigant database uh, comprising this, this 20 gigawatts. Um, there's also, uh, uh, there are also increasingly strong signs that governments are providing much needed enabling policy support. Uh, I have the example of India here, which has a draft national policy on renewable energy-based microgrids issued in 2016. It's still a draft policy, but we're seeing similar trends in, here in the U.S., in California, in New York, and other parts of the world, providing much-needed policy support and certainty, hopefully, to investors in microgrids. And in India, it's a particularly challenging problem. Uh, based on uh, recent figures from the IEA, there are about 240 million people without electricity access still in uh, India, and an additional 100 million who have access, but it's not very reliable. It's, it's available for four hours, of, of, four hours per day or less. Uh, but in this draft plan, uh, the government is, is setting a goal for 10,000 additional renewable micro and mini grid projects across the country within five years. That's a really, uh, really accelerated pace, uh, leading to about 500 megawatts of additional capacity all within the next five years. So this is a promising sign, one example of promising signs that policymakers are backing renewable microgrids uh, as well. So we have this confluence of trends. We have a strong need for development. We have strong needs for cleaner energy, not just for development, for, but for the world's energy needs moving forward. Cost trends that are very positive when it comes to, you know, reduced costs for solar panels, for storage technologies and so forth and continuing policy support. So what we'd like to do today is we'd like to explore in a bit more detail some of the opportunities and barriers uh, with respect to uh, microgrids uh, based on renewables and how can we accelerate them to uh, better meet the sustainable development needs in the areas of the world that, that need these technologies the most. So we've, we've designed the, the program to, be, uh, to give you somewhat of a narrative arc. So we have two technical sessions, one in the morning uh, and, uh, and, and one in the afternoon. In the morning technical session, which will be kicked off uh, by my, my former LBNL colleague, Chris Marnay, he's going to provide a scene setting presentation to sort of give an idea of, of what's, what are microgrids all about, what's their evolution, uh, and give you some, 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 uh, some overview of some of the success stories and characteristics of microgrids based on his experience from all around the world. Uh, and we're going to use that to dive into more deep uh, technical sessions. Well, well, we'll explore some of the technical policy and economic barriers related to microgrids. So in the first technical session, we're starting with the recognition that microgrids are already successful in many projects around the world. We'd like to learn more about, well, what makes them successful? What drove their adoption? What can we learn from those projects that might be transferable to a more developing world context, which may have greater uh, uh, infrastructure or economic constraints? And, we, and in the second part of that technical session, we'd like to drill down into more of the technical barriers. So how is storage doing? How is renewable energy doing? How are, how are the control algorithms doing? Where are there opportunities to make those systems more cost effective, more efficient, more viable uh, through additional research or overcoming technical barriers? So that'll set the scene uh, for, you know, the current state of knowledge with respect to microgrids, where they are and where they're going. We have the great fortune to have a, 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 on, on, on the program a, a lunch present, lunchtime presentation from our colleagues at Stone Edge Farm who will talk more about the renewable microgrid that they've set up in Sonoma County that Julio mentioned in his opening remarks. We'll get a high-level overview. Perhaps you'll have the chance to ask questions to show that it, it can be done and here's how they did it. And then in the afternoon technical sessions, we'll turn our focus more to the development challenge. So uh, I'm really pleased to have Hannah Daly here from the IEA who will talk about the IEA's really world-leading analyses on uh, the role of decentralized sources for improving in energy access and delivering sustainable energy to all by 2030. 
And that'll be followed by two uh, deep dive technical sessions where we'll, we'll start to unpack some of the success stories that we're already seeing with respect to renewable microgrids uh, in the developing world. And then we'll close up by reiterating some of the, what's at stake essentially. What are the key human and economic benefits that we could realize? How could microgrids really help us achieve the sustainable development goals? What are some of the important dimensions that we should keep in mind? And then, of course, we have uh, a reception scheduled for immediately after the closing of the conference. It'll last for around 90 minutes. We encourage everyone to attend because another goal of the conference is to uh, help, help Northwestern, but, but everyone in attendance expand their networks in this field. Um, and so as part of that spirit, we're, we're going to try to make this program very interactive. Uh, so we'll have panel sessions with moderated Q&A, but we'll also reserve time for audience questions. So uh, questions are encouraged. Uh, the way to ask a question is pretty straightforward. You raise your hand. We've got microphones that'll be roaming around the room. And we just ask that you state your name and your affiliation so others are aware of, 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 of where you come from and, and what your background is. Uh, and that'll help us all get to know each other a bit better. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I hope this was a useful overview of what you can expect today. And I wish you an enjoyable and productive symposium. And uh, I suppose I should introduce also <laughs> our first scene setting presenter, uh, Dr. Chris Marnay. So in lieu of providing uh, biographies uh, orally for all the presenters, we, we've given you bi brief biographical statements of everyone in the program which, to which we'll refer you to. But I can say personally, I worked with uh, Chris for a number of years at LVNL. Uh, he, he is one of the founding uh, sort of fathers of the GRIDS research group at Berkeley Lab, but he's now enjoying, I, I think, uh, a pretty busy retirement, right? <laughs> today, so today to it's pretty here. busy, yeah. So here's the, the clicker. And how do we start here? And, uh, let's make sure we've got your presentation loaded. Not there. Are they, uh, excuse me, are they on the desktop or? <laughs> it was there before. Okay, I'll, I'll start off slow here with uh, no supporting presentations. So uh, <clears throat> those two introductions there were great. Um, I'm very well set up here, which unfortunately means I don't have any good excuses. Um, as uh, Eric said, I'm gonna talk more about uh, the background of microgrids and uh, their development in the developed world. I'll try and uh, pull a few uh, implications here and there <clears throat> for their use uh, in development, but mostly this is uh, more background. Uh, so this is my agenda here. I'm going to talk some more about definitions. Well, you know, academics love definitions. We never can really get past them. And uh, as Eric already pointed out, there's been a lot of confusion about definitions in this particular area. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the power sector is really changing uh, everywhere in the world, including the developed world. And, uh, you know, that may not seem that amazing if you're not from the power sector yourself. <clears throat> but things don't change very fast in general in this sector. So it's pretty exciting for us to, to, to really be... Uh, the center of attention. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about background. Um, in the US, there's quite a lot of activity these days at the state level. I'm just going to mention two particular programs. One, the New York Prize, and another new one just starting up in California, funded by the California Energy Commission. Uh, and then I'm going to give a couple of examples. And these are both developed world examples. One's New York University. I focus on this one because it was very influential in policy making in the Northeast, the performance of this particular one, as well as a few others during Superstorm Sandy. And then a new development, which just opened in 2016 in Japan, Higashi Matsushima, which uh, is, uh, was developed in the aftermath of the great East Japan uh, earthquake and tsunami. And it's kind of indicative of where things are going in Japan, which is one of the major areas of microgrid research. And then finally, a few uh, implications. Okay, so let's get into definitions. So these first two are very common ones, and uh, the one that Eric showed there is the second one, which uh, widely used in the US. These first two are very similar in the sense there's two key characteristics of a microgrid. Number one is it's a locally controlled system, and number two, it can either function 
uh, connected to the grid in the way that we're all familiar with, or it can function as an island under certain circumstances. And uh, I'm going to try and stick to those uh, basic uh, definitions. I'll give you a few more. So as Eric already alluded to, this creates a problem here, which is where do remote microgrids that can't connect to the grid fit in? And this has uh, really been difficult for the first 10 years or so that we've been using this definition. And I noticed starting last year that DOE had uh, done some revisionist history and added a final sentence here to try and take care of this problem and include microgrids. Uh, ben here at the front and myself were both involved in the writing of this definition, so we do have a certain copyright on it. So, uh, but this is a recurring problem with, re with uh, remote systems. And uh, it's a much bigger problem than you might think because technically a lot of the research is actually on remote systems and there's a number of reasons for that. They're smaller, et cetera, they're quite obvious. One of the less obvious ones is that that's where a lot of the difficulties are in power systems. And if you go to a utility and you say, I want to demonstrate this new technology, it's unproven, they will say, we got this great place up in the mountains, that would be perfect. And a lot of their problems are there, so they always encourage it. However, more recently, the best brains at DOE have actually been thinking more creatively. And in their latest version of the definition, the added sentence is gone, but they realized if we can remove the word both, then that's going to take care of the problem. So this is the working definition as we know it now. This other one that you can see here I put uh, from New York, uh, State Energy Research and, Develop and Development Authority, nice IRTA. You can see it's completely different. And uh, this comes about because of a big change in direction of microgrid development following uh, Superstorm Sandy, as I already mentioned. And you can see that this definition completely focused on sustainability. And I'll get more into that. So one of the first questions that come up, what's the relationship between microgrids uh, and uh, the smart grid? And uh, the way I normally answer that is to look at this definition. We're very lucky in the US that there is a definition of smart grid written into law. It was in the ISA Act of 2007. For my money, there's three different stools to the smart grid, three different legs to the smart grid uh, stool. And you can see them here. <coughs> One is improved opera operation of the traditional high voltage system. The second is better interaction between customers and the grid. And they, actually, this is where most of the action has been with smart metering and demand response, et cetera. And the third is where microgrids live, which is in a much more distributed, dispersed control of the whole system. This definition has a lot of details, and I've color coded them there to try and demonstrate that you can fit them into each of those three buckets, more or less. So one more definitional obligation is the difference between uh, reliability and resilience. Reliability is a kind of probabilistic concept. It's pretty well defined typically by IEEE or some organization and appears in all kinds of forms. Um, this one in the middle there, SADI, is the most common one. How much outage are you likely to experience during a year? And this is probabilistic. If we just sat around long enough, measured when the power went out and came back on and so on, we could get a good estimate of reliability. Resilience is a much more slippery concept and it's a much more general concept. It has to do with how well prepared are you for a disaster? How well do you perform during it? And very importantly in power systems, how well do you recover after? And uh, restoration, one of the biggest issues in power systems, as you know, following the news after several disasters. So here's a bit more data on uh, reliability, and this shows SADI in a number of different countries. And the th first thing to note is there's a big range. The US, we're up in the range of a two or three hours a year outage we're likely to experience, and we are likely to experience an outage in a year. Uh, the big economies in Europe are usually around one hour, and then uh, the best in Europe is Luxembourg at about 10 minutes uh, per year. And uh, Japan was extremely good as one of the best countries in the world before the earthquake. And you can see those three fiscal years. You can see the effect there in the year of the earthquake. Now, here lies one of the difficulties with this kind of statistics because it's very unclear how you measure extreme events whether they really get into this data or not. And typically they do not. So even though there was a lot of outages uh, 
recorded here in Japan. This is not actually the direct effect of the earthquake and tsunami. This is other outages because of the weakness of the system. Best in the world today is Singapore by far. Uh, and uh, it's almost an obsession there. And I, I added here particularly because I was recently in Singapore. And of course, there's an anecdote, which is going to Singapore and knowing this, I couldn't wait to tease them about it. And uh, they got back to me because the power went out in my hotel. <laughs> but, it, but it turns out it was not a grid outage. It was just an outage in the building. And I have always said that when you get to a certain point, there could be a real big advantage in high reliability because you could get rid of backup generation and all kinds of other, other uh, costly requirements. But at this particular hotel, the first thing I see when I get there is two huge backup generators in front of the building. This is in downtown Singapore, really expensive uh, real estate. And I actually got to see one of them running. <laughs> so a very rare experience for visitors to Singapore. So, uh, over here on the left, you can see the punchline here. Reliability is a great thing, and we always want more of it, and more is always better than less. But that doesn't necessarily mean we should be stuck on this treadmill of always getting to higher levels of reliability. And it's not as if life in Singapore you know, is so much better than these other countries. We have actually made some policy choices here that make a real difference. In Singapore, they have a 100% reserve margin on their power system, meaning or if all the power plants fail, they can still meet the load. So that is not costless. And while we think a lot about reliability and performance, we don't think very much about how much it's costing. And here lies a very important uh, policy issue. OK, moving on to the history sector. This is what the traditional power system looks like. There's very few big uh, stations represented by Target stores in this particular diagram. And then the bacteria that you can see everywhere are widely dispersed loads. And there's long distance transmission and distribution joining them. So this is my list of grievances about the traditional system. And I can spend a lot of time on these, but unfortunately it, it leads to arguments. So I won't spend much time. I will just tick them off as fast as I can and move on. And these are roughly in declining order of importance. So right at the top, you know, we have these other policy objectives that are very uh, contradictory to this very tightly controlled, centralized, hierarchical, extremely reliable grid. One is that we want to operate very close to the limits for efficiency reasons. A second is we want more uh, variable renewables attached to the grid. Uh, resiliency and security are extremely difficult in these kinds of grids. At the end of the day, today, hopefully you will know enough to uh, be able to go out and take down a few transmission towers and black out Chicago, if you so desire, uh, you're never going to make this a completely secure system. It's very vulnerable. The biggest problem with outages, as you well know, is that all the other infrastructures fail, transportation, sewage treatment, etc. cetera. Uh, we're worried about environmental constraints. Lo loads are growing, particularly electrification of transportation. So we have to worry about a bigger load in the future, as Eric referred to. Um, heat loss in central generation is something we can't uh, live with because of concerns, uh, climate change concerns. Reliability is costly. Nobody wants uh, more transmission towers in their backyard, so expanding the system is very really difficult. Next one, uh, DC. I will talk more about that, so I'll skip it here. Personally, I believe electric vehicles are a big game changers for a number of different reasons. One I mentioned is load. Another is that they're mobile. Traditional power engineers are not used to uh, loads and resources that move around. You know, the substations and so on tend to stay put. So this is actually going to change the nature of the power system in, in my view. Particularly, it makes power fungible. You can charge up your car at work during the day, go home and run your house off it at night. And this would be a great job benefit, right? You could also buy in one place and sell in a different, ex different one, et cetera. And uh, finally, I think we, we have come to realize in a general sense that dispersed systems are more reliable and resilient. OK, so that was my list that I've been using for at least a decade. But as Julio already set up, our whole perspective on the world in Northern California has now changed. And now our biggest concern on top of our list is fire hazard.
And it really seems that the Northern California fires, as well as many others uh, in Australia and Portugal, most notably, really were caused by the distribution system. So now nothing else matters, and we're just going to focus on fire from now on. I'm glad Julio made that clear at the outset. So please allow us to be somewhat parochial. So um, here's a, a, a picture that I like a lot better. Let's just assume that the traditional grid, which I'm calling the mega grid, is still around. Certain parts of the distribution network may be able to function independently from that under certain circumstances. I'm calling that a milligrid. And the importance of the distinction here is not quite so much technical. It has more to do with regulation. Uh, if there are legacy regulated assets involved, then the operating rules under which a milligrid is going to operate is going to be very different to an individual customer like Stone Edge Farm that we're going to hear from later. But those, the tr what I call true microgrids, and pedantically right with a mu here, uh, really are what are most common now. Large customers that have developed the ability to island from the grid. There's another important uh, aspect here, which I call nanogrids, which is we don't think much about it, but electricity is actually getting delivered, not just through the sockets and the wires and so on, but we're surrounded by other networks power over Ethernet being an important one, traditional telecom systems and so on. Those tend to be very low power, but very high reliability systems. And uh, tell us something maybe about what the future might be for more reliable systems. And I will get into that. And they're often uh, DC. OK, so motivations. Eric already mentioned this Navigant uh, database, and here's a couple of graphics that come out of it. Uh, the one on the top you can see shows that North America is pretty much world dominant. In Asia Pacific, 16% of that is Japan, uh, probably the second most important uh, country, as I mentioned. And then you can see the breakdown uh, uh, for the rest. Bottom right, uh, their definitions that they use in their database, not totally consistent. But you can see they do have this remote uh, classification, the big blue slice there, and it's huge. So again, this shows you that remote applications are actually very important here, even though they don't strictly meet the microgrid uh, definition. So the rest of this shows you what I think are the big motivations for microgrids. Top right of the big three, save money, lower emissions, and then reliability and resilience. And those will almost always come up, although, as I've already alluded to, the emphasis can really change between them. And I think one of the areas where we're not doing very well research-wise is actually taking a balanced view of the benefits that we're getting in each of those areas. Bottom left, two are sort of more modern, recent ones. One is that the microgrid becomes a kind of economic entity. And it allows it to participate in wholesale markets. And therefore, provision of grid services to the market and so on are uh, certainly motivators under some circumstances. And by buffering there, I mean that one of the potential advantages here is that maybe if we take care of some of those grid hostile resources in a more localized fashion, and particularly integrated with loads and other resources, et cetera, maybe we can shield the grid from those resources that they don't like so much. And maybe this is a kind of a service that can also be a revenue stream for microgrids. And then finally, independent surety is a very nasty word invented by the US military. And I'm not quite sure what it means, but it's something to do with everything works. Like we have access to the fuel, it's, we can deliver it, uh, we can burn it, etc. cetera. Nobody, nobody gets hurt. OK, so here's my sort of canned history of the first phase of microgrid research, which was up to the Great East Japan earthquake. And uh, very luckily, this history is nicely bracketed by these two events in Japan, signing of the Kyoto Protocol and Fukushima. Uh, right, uh, Europe was pretty active and pretty consistently active through this period, as you can see by the blue uh, European Commission flags there. But uh, following uh, the signing of the Kyoto Protocol, middle top, you can see Japan became very dominant. And it's not an accident that the Kyoto Protocol was signed there. Uh, Japan was an early mover on climate change. And they decided their research yen should go where their mouths were. 
And so these early projects were actually focused by and large on high renewable content and sustainability, not exclusively, but on the whole they were. Uh, and then you can see a, a lot of activity after that in the US, particularly involved uh, with this RDSI program that uh, Ben and I were both involved in. And then bottom right, not to forget, spiders uh, in the US military. And in fact, I would say that the US military is the only institution on the planet that have actually accepted microgrids as a default. And uh, they have really followed through on this research. Okay, so as I said, all that changed because of two events, the Great East Japan earthquake and uh, Superstorm Sandy. So one of the results of that is the New York Prize program. And uh, this is a fascinating piece of uh, public policy uh, in my mind. And what it is, um, is a competition and uh, in three different phases. In the first phase, they gave uh, $8,300,000 grants to communities to come up with a, a microgrid sort of conceptual uh, plan. They're all there on the NYSERDA website. Uh, they're about 100 pages each, so you can go and, and sift through. They're all very similar. They're all a local community that wants to improve the resilience of emer emergency services or maybe a school, something like that and they've teamed with um, a big engineering firm or somebody like that to come up with their plan. We're now in phase two, which started last year, when a small number of them, about eight or nine, got million dollar grants to develop a more detailed uh, plan. Uh, they're nearly all uh, exactly like the ones I described. There's one outlier, which is really interesting, which is one of the grants went to Amtrak to try and improve the resiliency of one of the commuter lines out of New York. And here, this is very important from the point of view, as I mentioned before, which is infrastructure interdependency, I think is one of the uh, mistakes we're going to come to realize that we made. And here's an effort to put it into reverse, and it's a different kind of microgrid. It's disaggregation, not uh, by area, but uh, by sector. And if we could protect some of these critical sectors like transportation in some independent way, this would be very advantageous. And DOE has some projects of this kind too uh, in New Jersey. Eventually there's going to be a build out here. As you can see there, this pro program is about 40 million. I think it's actually a bit bigger than that now. The California one is of a very similar size. So California has been very involved in microgrids from the beginning. And... Uh, have funded a lot of work that we've done at Berkeley Lab over the years and so on. These uh, little uh, thumbnails here show you some of the well-known California projects, but their participation has been a bit erratic, uh, you know, blown hot and cold at different times. Now they're just starting up this new program, which uh, shows a lot of promise, and you can see the key features there. It's about $47 million that they've allocated so far eight or nine projects that will start this summer. They're pretty short projects, three or four years, but there's two characteristics of the program that I think are important. Number one, it's pretty short, and the focus of it really is to show the business case, which again, uh, I, I got a brilliant uh, warm up by what Eric said, uh, you know, we're at this stage of microgrid development now where we feel we've got the technology under control and we have gotta find an economic way to go out and uh, do it. The second feature that I think is interesting is in keeping with California legislation, no fossil resources are allowed whatsoever in this, pro in this program. It's not exactly sure where the line in the sand is drawn, but I mean, for example, if you already had a CHP system and you wanted to change the controls so that you can add a renewable resource, I'm not quite sure whether that's allowed or not. You know, when we know more about these projects approved, we might learn. But you can see a dichotomy here where the Northeast is totally focused on resilience and now California totally focused on sustainability. So, well, you know, this is, uh, I've forgotten the correct word for it in policy making, but one of the benefits of a federal system is it's a sandbox when all of these people can go out and do their own thing and we can learn from them. And this is one example. Looking ahead, I think one of the big issues in California is going to be the zero net energy mandate. All residential buildings from 2020 are going to be zero net energy, and all, well, that's new construction. 
and all new commercial buildings from 2030. This is going to have a big effect. And I think it's going to be a big boost for microgrids and renewables. So these two examples very quickly, New York University, clearly a project that would not have qualified uh, for the California CEC program. New York University is near Washington Square, uh, and uh, their power plant is near 4th Street. Uh, during Sandy, I believe, everything south of 10th Street was blacked out, and this project was able to function for more than a week as an island. Ironically, uh, it was only a year old at that time, and the motivation for the development, improvement of the system was uh, sustainability. It came out of a city grant to try and lower carbon footprint. Uh, and it is a CHP system, so obviously a big improvement over the grid, but not as good as renewables. Uh, they have a combined heat and power system that covers a pretty big area, a number of different buildings around here. Uh, the actual plant is underground, and it's underneath this uh, square here, Gould Plaza, and uh, an amazing piece of engineering. I have to say I was incredibly impressed when I went there. This is the control room. It looks like a submarine. And, uh, you know, walking around and playing frisbee there, you just wouldn't realize these guys were laboring away under your feet uh, to keep the lights on. Uh, because it's underground, all of the maintenance equipment uh, deliveries all come through this one elevator, which is about big enough for a very small car. I mean, it's tiny. And, uh, you know, just so you know, the turbines are not at all tiny. <laughs> this is a pretty big system. Okay. Now, uh, Higashi Matsushima, so, you know, if you're a uh, work in city government, this is exactly what you don't want your, your city to look like, right? This was totally traumatic. Uh, this is up on the northeast coast of Japan. I'm going to show you in a bit more detail. So very heavily affected uh, by the tsunami in this area. So, in fact, um, Higashi Matsushima is over here and it's very close to Sendai which I mentioned because here is about the most famous microgrid in the world at Tohoku Fukushi University and it was the excellent performance of this microgrid during the earthquake and tsunami that really had a big policy impact in Japan so you can see a trend here you know if you want more microgrids I'm afraid you've got to get through a decent disaster first hopefully the fires are it for us we don't we don't know yet so Higashi, and it's on slightly high land, I forget the altitude, but it's just a few hundred meters. Um, Higashi Matsushima, not so much, as you saw from the photograph, it's right at sea level. And it was, this whole area was devastated here. Um, I think they pretty much decided that everything uh, outside of this rail li line here, they're not going to rebuild. And then the area between the railway and the road is what they're rebuilding. And that's where this little demonstration site is. And I say little because, you know, a lot of people have the idea that all of Igashi Matsushima was rebuilt as a microgrid. Well, that's not true. I mean, there's this one area of it. And you can see it's not particularly big. There's a 400 kilowatt PV array. So one of the things they've done is raise grade by a meter everywhere in this area. And you'll see a picture of that. Underneath the PV is a kind of sinkhole for drainage. Uh, there's new housing that's served. So this red area is the actual microgrid. New housing here is served. And then there's a, a community center, which is going to serve as an emergency shelter if ever needed. And all of this is able to island. They also serve uh, several other medical facilities. And so since they were starting with a blank sheet here, they were able to focus these facilities in this particular area. So lots of medical buildings around here. So this is what it looks like. That's the PV array. And maybe you can just tell over here that it's below grade by a meter. Uh, this uh, building in the top left is the community center. This is some of the housing. They call them single houses, but in fact, they're duplexes with uh, one apartment downstairs and one upstairs. And it's pretty austere. This is certainly not a luxury development by any means. In Japan, they always get into lots of trouble over power lines, and this is no different. They're never quite able to decide what the utility is doing and what the microgrid is doing. In this case, the microgrid is, in fact, an entity and provide, runs its own distribution. 
But here at the point of common coupling, there's a big mess. And again, that seems to be very typical in Japan. They have a backup generator which uses biodiesel. And this is a, their battery system. So I think this is a very good example of the way things are going, particularly in Japan. And uh, one of the things I find most interesting about uh, this development and the way things have gone is that following um, uh, the Great East Japan earthquake, microgrids sort of got outside of uh, our uh, world in the energy community. And this project was actually uh, funded by the Ministry of Environment. NEDO is the ministry that funds research. So, you know, you know and a genie got out of the bottle here very quickly. And you see a lot of activity elsewhere in the education ministry trying to make the schools microgrids, for example. And I think it was a really big change. This is one of those medical buildings. Okay, I'm going to skip DC distribution because Eric's on my case here. Uh, just to say, uh, there's a lot of good reasons why we would have DC in buildings, and this is very relevant for sustainability because very often these small systems uh, will very likely be DC. And uh, probably as a result, when they start to get interconnected into a grid, you know, the grid's going to look pretty different. Maybe different in the sense that it's not hierarchical, we've got much more dispersed control. But technically, it might be uh, pretty different too. So I'll just go straight to the punchline on this graph. Some modeling of a building uh, in LA that we've done. This building has a pretty big PV system and a pretty big battery system. And we've tracked the losses under AC in this column and DC in this column. And the thing to note here is this huge source of losses, more than 10% in this building. And I, I happen to know that on average in the US, the losses between the generating station and the panel at, the, at your house is about 8% on average. So 8% of the energy gets lost cutting from the power plant to your building. More than that gets lost between the socket and the device. That, to me, is an amazing result. And that's exactly one of the big motivations for DC. We're doing a project. Uh, our partners are Xingye Solar in China. Uh, they develop uh, building integrated PV. So there's lots of it here on their research building. One particular floor they have set up so it can run on either AC or DC. And we're trying to do a side-by-side -side test here. And uh, when I say DC, running straight through the same wiring. So something that we would never be allowed to do at, at uh, Berkeley Lab, uh, let me say. OK, now to my closeout. Eric said if I followed his timing rules, and I hope I have, he would let me have two 30-second uh, commercials here. The first is that uh, Ben and I organized an international symposium on microgrids together for many years. Even though I'm still retired, I still like to meddle. Uh, this year, it's coming up in Bucharest in September. It's a by invitation only for only the world's most famous microgrid researchers. And the way that you join this elite group is after this uh, presentation, you give me a card and write on it symposium. <laughs> and uh, then you're qualified. <clears throat> Uh, finally, for the researchers in the audience here, uh, I was a guest editor on a special edition of Applied Energy that came out in January, and I'm trying hard to make this an annual thing. We had 53 papers published here. One of the research difficulties that we have with microgrids is most of the material gets published in IEEE transactions or similar electrical engineering journals, so it's fantastic for the electrical engineering, but Actually, everything else goes missing, and you know, as has already been mentioned, sort of the finance, public policy, all kinds of other aspects of microgrids are, are really not developed that fast, and here's one eff effort to uh, try and redress that a bit. So uh, April 30th is the deadline to get papers in for the one next year. So if anybody's got some stuff ready for publication, let me know. And if you contact me, I'll give you a few tips on what I saw was uh, mostly uh, successful this year. OK, so I've talked a bit uh, about the history of microgrids. Basically started around the turn of this century. Nothing annoys microgrid people more than to say, oh, well, you know, we had this 100 years ago and all the systems were isolated. <gasps> please, don't, please don't say that. Modern microgrids uh, from the turn of the century 
And there really is a technological revolution going on here. I don't want to lose track of that. It's the power electronics, the control of resources, control of loads, inverters, local sources, and so on, that is really uh, driving this change. And uh, I think I've covered most everything here. Yeah, again, I think one of the areas we're not doing so well is really trying to look across the board at the different aspects of microgrids and focusing, most of the projects tend to focus on one uh, attitude or another. DC, DC is a particularly important uh, technology, but it's only a particularly small uh, example of what I like to call heterogeneous power quality. Because of modern power, uh, power electronics, we're able to really control the quality of power, both in terms of reliability, in terms of harmonics, etc. So we can think of a system in which we have much more closely tailored power for the requirements of the load. So everything is upside down now in my view, which is we live under this tyranny where the I, everything is done for the service of the ISO. We've got this huge brittle system and everything has to work uh, in slavery towards protecting its reliability. And the reason that we have the power that we do at the sockets is all to do with this sort of global problem. But we could have a very different kind of power system where we manage all that locally. And that what's going on in terms of uh, big scale transmission can be something secondary. And I think this is really important in sustainability because if you don't have a legacy grid, then you can maybe think of it developing in a different way. So I left a couple of questions here. Do we really need highly reliable, a highly reliable grid for proster uh, prosperity? And uh, how will uh, changing technology affect development. And I did go over four minutes, sorry. Thank you. Promise, Michael. Yeah, and I mean, you've obviously, and you've uh, seen lots about it in the press. Uh, you know, a, a gold rush of microgrid researchers going to Puerto Rico telling them to do it all differently when they rebuild it. Uh, I didn't mention this with Higashi Matsushima, but one of the problems with this kind of business model where we all rush in after a disaster is what everybody really wants is it all to be built back as fast as possible. And you will see this as a result of the Sonoma fires, and Craig and I have talked about this. You may have a better idea and you may have a better vision, but what people want is their house back. And so under those circumstances, it's very difficult. With Higashi Matsushima, as I said, uh, this demonstration is pretty small. It isn't like they try to change the whole nature of the city. And you have to think about the situation here. These are mostly elderly people. As you know, Japan has got a pretty elderly population. And, uh, you know, they, it's, this is not a population that is going to be very friendly to change. They've suffered this huge trauma. Uh, you know, the thing that you want to do is to get them back into a stable environment again as soon as possible. So it's not easy in this kind of situation. Um, do you have any, uh, uh, so perhaps, uh... Oh, this, did you have a question? Uh, Jack Wadsworth, a bunch of things, but a board member of the California College of the Arts where we are studying a micro grid for that campus. Uh, I also convened a symposium on Puerto Rico, and one of the things that you didn't mention, uh, we got very much into the technology and the speed and the you know cost and all that sort of stuff. Rocky Mountain Institute was there, but what made it absolutely positively an intractable problem was politics. 
I mean, the politics are so terrible and the leadership was so terrible that, uh, you know, the idea of almost any solution was inconceivable. And uh, that doesn't come up in, on any of your charts. I don't know what the answer is, but if you don't have that kind of vision, you know, somewhere in the leadership, nothing happens. That was my next slide. Eric just cut me off. <laughs> no, you're right. And, uh, you know, with everything, with the power sector, you just really have to start from a recognition that this is a highly regulated industry. Everybody is a stakeholder in the power system. So change, as I, and I did mention, tends to come glacially, and that's one of the reasons. You've just got to be realistic about that. And that's why I think these kind of uh, what I call true microgrids. I hope everybody appreciated that I was trying to be SI compliant here with mega, milli, micro, and nano. But this is where uh, true microgrids with a mu really play a role because obviously on your own site with your own system, there's a lot more than you can do. And the fact that most of the microgrids that we see of that type is obviously no accident. I'm on overtime now, so... Hello, uh, my name is Janet Ginsburg. Is this working? Or am I just talking? I'm just going to talk. Good. Um, early in your talk, you talked about 6,000 6, terawatts. Gosh, that works. Uh, globally. And as you, know, as you talked about all these projects, they're wonderful projects, but if you don't incorporate efficiency of everything into the mix, you're just replacing one distribution system with another kind of distribution system. So with that 6,000 terawatts, how much do you think can be shaved off, and how does efficiency weave into these projects that you're talking about? So um, the, I think Eric said that the total size of uh, microgrids worldwide is about 20 gigawatts, and so that's 20 gigawatts of power. Yeah, I misspoke. Uh, it's 6,000 gigawatts globally. So six ah, gigawatts now. well, I mean, uh, yeah. So uh, in place, there's around 13 or 14 gigawatts. Last time I looked, 2020, we're getting in the range of 20 gigawatts of power. Um, I pointed out that the remote slice of that pie is big. One of the reasons it looks big is, of course, these remote applications have a lot of renewables in them. So it means there's a lower capacity factor there. So if you looked by energy, that would look a, a lot smaller. But uh, to your point, of course, you're completely right. And you know, if, Eric, if only Eric had given me another couple of days, I would have got more into the DC work. And that example that I showed you there we tried very hard to simulate what this building might look like in 2030 when it would be subject to the zero net energy standard. So that means a lot of efficiency, you know, PV on the roof, a battery system, you know, all of these things that certainly wouldn't be a typical building today. So there's absolutely no doubt that, that you're right. Nearly always efficiency turns out to be the first best option. But you know, you're going to get to a point where there's not much more that you can really do with efficiency. But uh, another aspect where efficiency is very important there is to do with a lot of the devices get to be uh, very small in terms of power load. So if you have LED lights, I mean, those lights might be one watt. And so this is one of the motivations for DC systems, which is when you get down to loads that small, is it worth having an electrician putting in this wiring having it inspected and then having to get a permit every time you want to move a socket from here to there? Probably not. And so those kind of systems are probably going to look much more like Ethernet or your phone. And it's just something that you plug in and you can unplug it yourself and move it around and so on. And this could be one of the potentially big cost advantages of DC. Yes, I mean, uh, you know, we obviously want to do the best in every single area and we want to get to the best possible outcome. And I think efficiency is obviously going to be important. Can I stop now, Eric? <laughs>
All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Armin Wei. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science here at Northwestern, and I'll be moderating our first panel. So we are very honored to have Stephen Walls, the lead of Energy Transition Initiative Program at uh, U.S. Department of Energy here, and also Ben Kropowski, the uh, director at uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, NRO, here with us. So our first panel is going to focus focus on uh, what can we learn from existing systems. And I'm going to start off with a few questions um, for the panel and after which we'll open up the floor for the audience. Okay? So um, as uh, Eric and Chris already talked about, there's a lot of different kinds of microgrids when we start talking about them. Some of them are um, on one campus, farm or institution that may be connected to the rest of the system and others would be running in a remote area, maybe in the island mode. And then it could be also running on completely renewable resources or, or other kind of energy and other kind of uh, characterization of them. So to start off, could you tell us a little bit about you and your experience with different kinds of microgrids? So I think we can start with Stephen. You have your slides loaded. I think my mic's on now. Is yep. that good? Good. Yeah, so I'm Stephen Walls. I'm very glad to be here. I met Eric actually when uh, at an IEA meeting in Tokyo where we were waxing about what an island actually is from an electricity perspective. And I was there because I work on island and remote systems for the energy transition initiative at the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy within US DOE. Uh, our goal is to help island and remote communities transition away from their current dependence on heavy fuel oil as a pro predominant fuel and rely on energy efficiency and local energy resources to improve their energy security and sustainability. We have a few tools and resources designed to help that and I'll, there will be a URL a little bit later. Um, one of the big things that we have is our main publication is called The Playbook, where we've distilled lessons learned from our experience over the past 10 years with a variety of locations. Our, our work is based on investments that DOE has made in Hawaii, U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, um, but also remote places like Greensburg, Kansas, um, which was a predominantly enrol-driven project. But the idea is that there's a community-based focus on all of this work because you can't change one piece of a system that small without very serious ramifications both to policy but also to the engineering and to the economics. So it's important to make sure that it's a community driven process and that we focus on people and projects. Some of the work that we do now is with Sandia National Lab focused on microgrid design and planning. They've worked first with the Department of Defense in Korea, but then they've also worked in a variety of other places. One of their big successes is the Philadelphia Navy Yard. They were technical consultants to the Navy Yard Redevelopment Authority on what their electricity system would look like. The Navy Yard was built in the 20s or 30s and focused on the diesel steamships. And as the Navy moved away from that technology, the Navy Yard was bracked or was closed. And the land was transferred back to the city and they needed to redevelop, it, redevelop the, the land. And what they decided to do was a mixed use development. Eventually they decided to do that and it became the coolest shipyard in America. And it's, that is in part because they have a microgrid. From the very beginning of the redevelopment, the microgrid concept was integrated into the master plan. The redevelopment master plan for the whole parcel and the energy master plan were issued on the same day. And that's a really important point because we've already mentioned Puerto Rico a little bit. Um, one of the issues that's already been discussed is this kind of lack of coordination and lack of foresight. And in the Navy Yard redevelopment, that was not an issue. In fact, from day one, they were considering the electricity and energy implications of their redevelopment. Uh, 
<laughs> there we go. So one of the interesting facets here that we'll, I think I've seen in a few other instances is that there's, um, there has to be an improvement to the status quo by deploying a microgrid. So it's sort of like a, a bargaining problem in that if deploying a microgrid can increase the overall utility of the microgrid owner and the, the larger utility system, then its path to deployment is much smoother. And we see that in Philly. Based on the success, um, we redeployed Sandia to an area of Oahu that was also a Navy yard that was bracked. Um, not all closed DOD facilities are very successful in redevelopment, but one of the things that Philadelphia has going for it is location. It's right next to downtown and very close to the airport. Similarly, in Oahu, this one part of near Honolulu is close to Honolulu, it's also close to the airport. So it has the location, location, location you need for real estate success, but it also has the defunct distribution system that you need to kind of set a clean slate. And so Sandia worked with the community there to maybe two dozen different partners to talk about what their needs are, do some level setting, make sure everybody understands what the benefits of microgrids can be, but also what the costs are, because these things aren't free. And so it's really important to understand what it is that the community wants out of the system in order to do the engineering properly. And this is one potential path. They're looking at deploying several megawatts of renewables on empty land within the parcel. And this will help contribute to Hawaii's overall goal of 100% renewable energy. Uh, besides those two, which are in the developed world, we, to pick up on the distinction between micro and what I call mini grid or just small remote systems, microgrids can disconnect from the larger system. I've also looked at, um, I've been to Papua New Guinea and Palau recently, as well as USVI in Puerto Rico, and there's applications for both small remote systems that rely on renewable energy and islandable systems that are connected to the larger grid. Uh, PNG is an interesting case study for all of these different applications because they have some urban population and an increasingly urban population, but they also have a few million people who are still remote and the terrain is inhospitable uh, and the centralized grid that has been used for the past hundred years in a developed world doesn't really make sense for them. So it's an interesting way to deploy or to study a lot of the different kinds of applications of this technology. Okay, so I'm uh, Ben Kroposky. I'm the director of the Power Systems Engineering Center at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And I've been involved with microgrids uh, at one form or another for over 20 years. Um, and have done kind of the full range of evaluations, uh, designs, looking at new technology integration into microgrid applications. And that includes both the, as we were calling them, remote microgrids, so these off-grid island systems. Um, so we've done a lot of work that have, um, you know, focused on small islands, uh, especially because a lot of times, uh, initially, say, over the last 20 years, one of the big driving forces, these were mostly diesel-based uh, power systems and power grids, and one of the big things was to re reduce the amount of diesel fuel usage in these systems. So we were looking at how to add in more wind and solar battery technologies as they were developing over the last 20 years to reduce that overall diesel um, amount of actual fossil fuels and diesel fuels, because often it's, it's really expensive just to get the fuels to these locations. So you'll see those in island power systems. We did a lot of work on bigger islands like Hawaii, but also uh, smaller and remote village applications that you would see maybe in the Alaskan um, uh, area. You see a lot of these very small power systems that are supporting small uh, local villages uh, and adding in wind and solar into these systems dramatically reduce the amount of diesel fuel. So we've done a lot of uh, work over time on how to get those more effective uh, in terms of renewable applications. Um, maybe over the last 10 years, we've done a lot of bigger focus on these microgrids that sometimes are connected to the bigger grid, but then for reliability or resilience reasons, uh, have the ability to isolate themselves and run independently from the grid. 
And we've done a number of projects in that space, all the way from kind of an industrial park application where you may have one client inside that industrial park that has a lot of distributed generation, uh, but they have the ability to provide power to their local customers. Um, DOD bases, so an example of that would be like Miramar out in San Diego, uh, where we've looked at adding in large-scale photovoltaics and biodiesel applications to improve resiliency in those bases. You'll see campus applications. So again, a lot of places where there was an existing uh, infrastructure on how to run a small power grid. You'll see this oftentimes at campuses where they've had a small power plant locally on site. Sometimes uh, cold weather climates, that's also developing steam for local use in the buildings. But those are really ideal applications for microgrids because they have a lot of on-site generation and you can just implement uh, ways to disconnect that from the larger grid. And then on bigger utility scale applications, probably one of the ones that's um, uh, really interesting in terms of large-scale renewable deployments is this one called, uh, Chris had a picture of it in his thing called Borrego Springs. It's outside, about two hours outside of San Diego in the desert. But they have a long transmission line that often gets disrupted with power. Um, and they have about 26 megawatts of PV uh, available to install into the local grid in that particular case. So. Uh, there's a huge variety of different applications for microgrids, and I've been involved with quite a number of them looking at, at the designs of these systems. A lot of that early work, we actually did uh, a number of reports on that were buried inside uh, an IEA task called IEA PVPS Task 11, which was on hybrid power systems. It revolved around a lot of the early designs on these types of systems. And a lot of that work migrated into, um, there's an IEEE standard called IEEE standard 1547.4, which was the first international standard on the design and operation of microgrids. And I actually chaired that particular working group um, and have published that work. So there's a lot of information available over the last 20 years on how you build, design these systems. Um, and um, there is a lot of information available, like I said. A lot of that got actually implemented into what's called the Island Playbook uh, that Stephen mentioned. But, but there's ways to handle a lot of the technical issues. There still are a lot of uh, challenges out there remaining, I think, in the microgrid space. We'll probably get into those in, in additional questions here. Yeah. OK. All right. Um, so th we mentioned a, a, a lot of uh, different applications of microgrids. So um, in those cases, were there alternatives to, in addition to microgrids? And what led to the final adoption of microgrids? What were the advantages of it that, to the decision of using it? Yeah. It's, a, it's a good question. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I think some of them, at least in the US so far, has been federal funding was driving that. Um, but, you know, in the case of the Navy Yard, the decision, the rede redeveloping that distribution system would be very expensive. And we're seeing a similar dynamic in Hawaii. The area that was served under the Navy when it owned uh, this, that parcel had seen underinvestment for maybe 10, 20 years. And so it was, the system was in a state where it needed a lot of fresh capital. And that would drive up rates under a traditional, the traditional policies that we have that would drive up rates for other rate payers just to redevelop that kind of niche redevelopment authority. Mm -hmm. And so the status quo for the main system was to just not get involved at all. But there was a big opportunity for folks with vision from the beginning to step in and say, we want to plan out a redevelopment that includes some of this really cool tech and these interesting capabilities that will attract new tenants and provide some value across the electrical boundary. Mm -hmm. So it was really that um, the driver was first, you know, a defunct distribution system that was kind of already there. Some vision, visionary planners that got involved in the, in the very early stages. Uh, and some unused land that they could put renewables on. Those are kind of the three big factors. Yeah, so I'd add, um, Chris had a great slide that, that mentioned two terms, resiliency and reliability. And I think that those 
have probably been the main driver for a lot of the actually installed operating microgrids. When you get down to it, you know, why did they put it in? Maybe if they did or not, it came down to money. But what was a driving factor? It was resiliency or reliability. And that's why we saw DOD be a big customer. They are willing to pay for resiliency and reliability. Uh, as you kind of walk down the spectrum of uh, who, if you want really reliable systems or not, that's where you see people wanting to pay for microgrid applications. So a lot of times, you know, people will pay for reliability by adding in backup gen diesel gen sets. Um, and then if they get into longer term outages, they realize, well, we need to actually look at how this is going to operate for a longer period of time, maybe a couple of days, instead of where a, a, a backup generator is really designed to run only very short in the hours time period. How do you design a more sustainable system that can run a little bit longer? So the DOD bases in the United States definitely were one of the early adopters of the technology of microgrids focused on how do we make sure this base can operate for days uh, if needed to. And so um, that's probably the number one application. Number two is you'll start to look at clients that are sort of remote, have maybe one access point for electricity. Uh, Borrego Springs was a good candidate in that particular case. They would lose their transmission line fairly regularly. So they needed to come up with a way that uh, enabled many days of, of sustained islandable operation. And in some of the industrial park applications, these were, everyone that I've looked at has been kind of a remote industrial park where they've already have generation uh, enabled out there uh, and they're able to provide local electricity customers. Probably one of the biggest challenges in that particular scenario is uh, policy and regulatory work on how you enable some clients that have generation to provide clients that don't have uh, generation. Great. Yeah. Um, so this is probably my favorite question. Um, while working on these projects, what are some surprises happened, either pleasant or not so pleasant ones? <laughs> I'll start. I'll mention. One of the first microgrid projects that I did was looking at um, a small industrial park in uh, the state of Vermont where the local uh, client basically had a lot of distributed generation uh, and they had a, dist a long distribution circuit that ran through the Green Mountains and any snowstorm they would lose power, um, you know, potentially for days while they were getting repaired. Uh, and what they wanted to do was island their little part of the industrial park. And then since they were, they were kind of, a, it was a small town, being nice neighbors, wanted to provide power to the four or five other local businesses that were in, in this industrial park. Um, sounds awesome, right? Uh, <laughs> and, and, we, and technically, we set up uh, ways to do it and everything. And then quickly found out that there was a policy regulation that prohibited you know, the customer right next door from providing power to the, to the client or the, per, the other company right next door to this. And literally, the, the, we thought it was an important project, so the company spent on the order of years getting approval and a state law changed to allow that to actually happen. Um, so it was, it's quite an amazing thing when you start going through the process of, yeah, it's nice to be a good neighbor, and here we have all this extra power available right next door to you, <laughs> but we can't even let you have the power for free, M much less how do you charge for it? How do you look at how that impacts the reliability of that customer or not. So there was, there's a lot of stuff in that space that still, I think, needs to be addressed. And, and if you just solved it for Vermont, that was great, but that doesn't solve it for 50 other, or 49 other states because everybody's got a slightly different set of rules and regulations in there. And that was probably one of the biggest disappointments I had in my microgrid trials was we had a beautiful microgrid all set up and ready to go and couldn't implement it because of a policy issue. Did they eventually get it approved? Eventually they did. Uh, so they, they eventually changed the rule, but at the end of the day, it worked out that it wasn't really feasible with all the bits and pieces to make it a viable business uh, to do that. So that, that one was, oh, was quite a while ago, and I think a lot of people have run into that challenge and tried to address it in a number of states, so hopefully that's a little better uh, 
story at the end of the day. You know, some of the other interesting challenges we've seen is how do, how do it get to higher and higher levels of renewable penetration on some of these remote microgrids because the driving factor has been uh, on remote systems is diesel fuel and, and not so much the cost of the diesel fuel but, but actually the transportation cost of the diesel fuel to get it out to these locations has been uh, really high. So if you had wind and solar, you're using local resources, you can reduce the amount of times you got to make it out to these sites to, to fill up the diesel. Um, and, and over the last 20 years, we've seen really good improvements in trying to get higher and higher penetration levels of renewables uh, to, to get to where we'd really like to see 100% renewable uh, remote microgrids. There, there are not a lot of 100% renewable microgrids because you have to over-design the, the renewable side so much. But with the cost coming down, it's good to start to see uh, some, uh, some potential availability in that space. And I'll follow on. I think one of the, unfortunately for me, not surprising things is the way the, the laws written in most places to protect a vertically integrated utility. If you can't sell an electron without triggering a whole, a whole host of regulation that will basically ruin your project. But I do think that some of the third party solar leasing companies have made a significant headway in changing that landscape in the past 10 years or so. Uh, and if you see me on my phone, it's because I have notes here. I'm not just playing in with it. Um, one, of the, one of the surprising problems that I found is just how much level setting needs to be done in the beginning to get everyone clear on what a microgrid can do and at what cost. Because I think we, one of, um, we worked with New Orleans to help them establish what we, what we call resiliency nodes following Hurricane Katrina. And I think the, it's been 17 years, maybe a little bit longer. No, not that long, but still. A long time, they're just putting steel on the ground now. That's how long it took um, to get some of this, the machinery moving in the right direction so that you could create within the residential areas of New Orleans these nodes where people could shelter in place and not ha all have to go to the, a centralized location or all have to flee. And microgrid technology is enabling that. But in the very beginning, you had to get everyone on the same page because people a lot of people were like, I never want to black out again. It's like, well, while well, technically that might be possible, here's what that would actually cost. People walk away from that, walk back from that pretty quickly once you show them how much capital they need to meet that initial goal. But then you just have to have like a very meaningful conversation about what the trade-offs are. Because how long do you think these nodes need to supply their own fresh water and electricity for refrigeration and medicine and other, and other critical needs. There's, you know, you can do some studies about that to help provide data, but ultimately that's a policy driven decision. And in, in order to get to the best possible outcome, you, a lot of level setting is, is needed. I think even now we struggle with, when microgrids are talked about in the press, they're talked about like a silver bullet. As in, they're going to solve all of your reliability and resiliency problems. And, they're, and because renewables are so cheap, like, you can just put them everywhere and it solves all these problems. Like, why aren't we doing this already? And so, you ha in order to actually have a very se an adult conversation about microgrids, you need to do some level setting on the engineering side to help them understand what the policy-driven goals are and how to get there. And on the policy side, what some of the engineering and cost constraints are. So that's the biggest surprise for me, is just how much has to go into those initial rounds of conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and do you feel it's getting better over the years? Uh, no. <laughs> I think it will. I don't think we've hit that tipping point yet. I don't think it's been there are enough instances of deployment to help make the, so that the information is just out there. I've read a lot of things about Puerto Rico where everyone's like, yeah, we're going to put microgrids everywhere. We're going to do 100. And that's, I don't know if that's realistic because I haven't had Ben study it. But 
it doesn't seem, I would guess that it's not realistic. But that's the conversation that's out there in the press. So I don't think it's really getting better, but I think it, once we do a bit more and this technology is applied appropriately and people see what it can do and at what cost, I think we'll, that it will get better, but we're not there yet. And hopefully symposiums like this will be helpful too, right, when we're talking right. about the constraints. Yeah. OK, so um, then maybe uh, the current policy and uh, finance side, things aside, just going forward, really envisioning what's happening to the microgrid field. What, what do you think will happen? So some of us have the picture, maybe we can replace the, the macro grid, the, the actual grid completely by just building a bunch of smaller microgrids or, or some other versions of that. So there will be lots of microgrids everywhere. Um, so in your mind and in your experience, uh, what do you think is realistically what will be happening and what would be the ideal thing that should happen? Um, so my opinion on this is that I, I think that there are very strong benefits to having a large scale grid. So a big transmission system that interconnects. So, so in the United States, a lot of the reliability that we have is because we have a large interconnected system. You get to share resources uh, by doing that. And so there's a lot of benefits to that. You also get um, access to remote resources. So large scale wind resources, large scale hydro resources. You're still going to want a big grid to tap into those very valuable resources. So in order to make the most economical system overall, there's still going to need to be some, some layer of large-scale transmission um, and interconnection to large-scale resources. At the same time, you know, the, the microgrid concept does offer a lot of interesting possibilities at the customer site itself. So that's where you'll see microgrids take off. And I still think that resiliency and reliability will be the main drivers of those two things. Uh, so, meaning uh, microgrids will be in place. And I think if we take kind of a different look at it, right now we, we go in and we find specific cases that need a microgrid <laughs> because they have a specific reliability issue. And that's, I think, very good for an individual client. But if there were ways that you could standardize placements of I islandable portions of grids that, that became more well known, whether, whether we call them microgrids or not, but at least smaller portions that have generation embedded in them, and, and we know that they could operate in a standalone mode for some period of time, that just increases the overall, I think, resiliency and reliability of the system itself and will become more popular. But I don't think that from an economic point of view that we would get to 100% all microgrids uh, all the time, meaning there are, are such big benefits from being able to bring in large scale generation uh, and interconnected transmission systems that we would want to make sure that that stays a vital part of the grid. So I, I see them both working together. Yeah, and I, I think it's safe to say that there will be some mix, and I, I think the real tough part is kind of reading the tea leaves and how much of the mix is centralized in large grid and how much is, is, is smaller, either it, whether it's island double or small remote systems. Uh, one, actually, one really interesting example that was talked about in Tokyo, the IEA conference I mentioned earlier, was a DC-based system that Sony Computer Science Labs deployed in a neighborhood in Okinawa. So on 20 houses, they put one of two standard PV and battery energy storage systems and then ran DC bus line among the 20 houses. And they found that it was more reliable and more resilient than the larger grid in Okinawa and those 20 houses were able to supply amongst themselves all of the electricity that they needed and never needed to go to the main grid. And they were able to do that in part because DC is more efficient at that scale. The trouble they actually had was finding all the equipment in the house that they needed to run on DC. Um, 
but it was a really interesting example, and it kind of shows the potential of a very, very different way of designing a system. But it underscores the, the, the common element in both a large system and the micro or mini grids in that the grid is, exists so that people can trade energy amongst themselves. Whether it's a whole bunch of people at, at, at an interconnect level or 20 houses in Okinawa. And I don't think there's gonna be a one size fits all approach to what makes the most sense. Um, there might be places, you know, thinking of sustainable development goals that Eric was talking about earlier. There will definitely be places that I would have guessed that would, it would make a ton of sense to, to deploy a small high renewable grid system that's not connected to a larger system. And those communities will develop around that electricity service, that model of electricity service. But there are other places that are either, that are already developed or are urbanizing where a larger system will be more economical. And if you look to the history of the way that the US has electrified Philippines, Vietnam, others, urban and centralized populations are economical to serve in a centralized fashion. I'm not exactly sure how, what the correlations are and what the exact dynamics are, but history has shown uh, enough times um, to make it, I think, statistically significant that urban populations are economical to serve in a centralized way. And then, so in those, within those, you might have pockets, whether it's industrial customers that can't afford power quality issues uh, affecting their, their product or critical infrastructure like hospitals and, and prisons that are, and airports that are all really close to each other, making sure that they never lose service or that they can break off from the grid for days at a time and, and, and ensure their service. I think you're gonna have this kind of patchwork. And getting to what Ben said, some way of kind of articulating what those different models are could go a really long way in, in facilitating their deployment. Thanks. Yeah, so we mentioned a couple of uh, different pieces. So if I were to ask you to pick one, what would be the, the most important feature that would make a microgrid success? It could be anything ranging from policy, physical, engineering, natural, cultural, economical. Um, and a, a more relevant question is, uh, so for that particular piece, what are things we as researchers or industry partner or government agencies or even individuals can do to help make microgrids more successful? This might be a bit too abstract or, uh, or generalized, but you asked for one, so I'm taking okay. it in that direction. Um, <clears throat> but I think for me, what the, the single most important factor is understanding what the electricity is going to be used for. So for a, a military base like Camp Smith, on Oahu, they have deployed microgrid technology, some diesel, some renewables, some battery storage, obviously energy efficiency. And they play really nicely with the larger utility system. They made it a net gain for them to deploy that technology. It benefits them, but they also play nicely with the larger system, and so it benefits the larger system as well. Um, but they, they know exactly what they need the electricity for, and they were able to value that and understand how to engineer for it. In a more remote location like in Papua New Guinea, where there is no electricity already, it's not as simple as stringing a line from a hydro plant to this remote community that doesn't have electricity because there's no load there. There are people there, but there's no load. So what, what is the electricity going to be used for? And while at like I said, it's, it sounds like an overly generalized statement. That does drive a lot of what the value of the electricity grids, whether it's small, remote, and highly renewable, or interconnected to the larger system, that's gonna drive what you need the electricity for is really gonna drive what system is optimal to serve that load. Okay, so again, we get to only pick one, right? So. To me, um, I guess the thing that, um, that kind of inhibits large-scale deployment of microgrids in my mind is actually um, cost. And by cost, it's really related to the custom 
customization of any microgrid. So right now, it's a custom design for any single project you do. Um, you go in, you have to sit down, you have to figure out what the load's being used for, what generation you have, but then it's a custom design basically for anything. And that really uh, complicates the, the quick deployment of microgrids. Um, so one thing that I think that would be really beneficial is like if somebody could sit down and make the, the Model T for microgrids. You just got this assembly line of microgrid boxes or whatever they are that pop off the line, they all plug together, you can make it any size you need and deploy it and the control systems work without a lot of fuss. Uh, right now, we don't really have that. <laughs> uh, and I think that that really just hampers quicker deployment and larger scale deployment of a valuable technology. Great, thanks. So uh, at this point, I'd like to open up the question uh, to the floors to see if anyone has any questions or comments. Yeah, uh, where's the mic? Hi, uh, I'm Jay Tineja from UMass Amherst. Uh, my question is around uh, models for ownership and uh, operation of mini grids, particularly for energy access scenarios. Um, so from each of your experiences, have you what kinds of models for ownership, what kinds of models for operation have you seen that have been successful? That's actually one of the other surprising things that I found in, in my work so far is that there is no single ownership model that is, is clearly the best in all circumstances. Um, the Philadelphia Navy Yard example, it's not energy access, but that was independent power producer. Hawaii, they're thinking about co-op. Uh, the US Virgin Islands is a municipally owned system where they're looking to microgrid St. John, actually Ben's, uh, working, Ben's team is working on that. Um, so there is no one way. You know, we've seen in the Philippines, the central government funding has been really, really important for energy access and the way that they do things. In the history in the US, electrifying rural areas was heavily dependent on federal funding. When in looking to the Pacific and seeing some of the energy access work there, whether it's um, development bank funded or otherwise, like someone with capital kind of creating a program has been really helpful. But as far as how the systems are owned, I think the main takeaway is that the local community has to be bought into the success of the system, because if not, it'll just sit there and rust. So if that means creating a co-op model, like here or, or similar to the Philippines, that's one thing, or municipally owned, like in the USBI, it's, but making sure the community's bought into the success of the system, because otherwise it'll just go to waste. Yeah, easily the most uh, successful systems have one owner. <laughs> so whether that's a DOD base, uh, a campus, but as soon as you get into, or even at a utility system, but as long as the utility owns all the assets, uh, then, it work, then things work really good. As soon as you get into multiple owners, then you get into a lot of regulatory issues as well as just coordination issues of when they're allowed to be on and off the microgrid and things of that nature. And I don't think those have really been fully worked out, at least here in the US. Um, here. Uh, I'm Christopher Seth, I'm from Tilly 10. Uh, we're sustainability consultants and we're working on the CCA project that, that Jack mentioned. Um, I'm specifically interested in for some of these smaller microgrid systems supporting smaller communities, uh, especially those with really high renewable power. Um, what what is important for the community to understand about that power source? And do you have any examples uh, where the community's role in their consumption of energy has changed as a way to kind of bring more efficiency into the system uh, to really begin to kind of work on that efficiency side along with the change in provision of a renewable source? I would just say uh, my biggest uh, question when you when you talk about that is how much of it is islanded <laughs> at any particular time, right? Because 
when you're running in an island mode and you have a lot of renewable sources, then you really have to pay a lot more attention to energy use. So one of the big things they go in there is look at loads. How do you reduce loads to as much as, po as, much as possible so that you can minimize the amount of renewable technology plus some energy storage technology to run your microgrid. When you get grid connected, all of a sudden, all those constraints disappear. And so it's tricky when you have that conversation with people because now there's this you know, in, infinite supply wire on the other side in their head that, that they don't have to care so much about that. When we go do uh, off-grid remote power systems, you definitely, you don't have that nice connection. And so you really pay attention to every little watt that, that's getting used. Um, and, and people, write, they, they really pay attention to energy. Um, and it's really difficult to make that transition from where you're really paying attention to it to where all of a sudden it's not a constraint on your system. And, and, and how do you educate consumers that, aside from paying a little more, um, they have to pay attention to energy usage? Um, I don't know. I've, I've found that it's just it's difficult to have that conversation and have people really understand it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's why I'm curious to hear um, I mean, yeah, I think, well, I think there's a, there's a handful in, within the U.S. that we can point to. I'm sure there are international examples as well. But um, I think Kodiak, Alaska is a good example. And that NREL team was heavily involved with that, where the Kodiak is not 100% renewable, although at times it can be. Yeah, so on a given hour or a given day, it might be all renewable. But on an annual basis or 10-year basis, it's probably 90 Eighty percent, something like that. So it's pretty good. And the way that they uh, they are somewhat tricky in that there is industrial load there, and it's seasonal. So they need to make sure that they're des they've designed a system that can run efficiently in times of low load when there's no industrial load, but then also ac accommodate that when it's happening uh, in those couple months. So I think Kodiak is a really good example. Um, and really, I don't think anyone's really dug into the behavioral changes and articulated the stories around that, but there definitely were some, and that would be one a good research question. So we've seen similar um, activity in, or a similar dynamic in uh, the islands off the coast of Maine. Very, very small permanent populations, but big spikes in seasonal population. It's all recreational. So it's all commercial load, all kind of similar. You don't have any the the inertia problem that you do when you have industrial load. But uh, those kind of spikes and making sure that there's optimal heat f in the winter time when there's no one there and enough electricity for a bit of cooling and the big tourist population. And the way that renewables play on the system has driven some behavior change there. And one of the big things that we see is making sure that uh, things are as efficient as possible. Because uh, particularly in Maine, they have these, this program called Weatherization Week, where they do they try to facilitate centralized procurement of goods because these all these places are difficult to get to, and you can increase the purchase power going from one customer to 50 customers, but th that's not exactly economies of scale. Where you get most of the savings is renting the boat to deliver all of the stuff, um, and so. Like they'll do efficiency first, add some renewables, and then, but because of that, they also need to know what's going to run and when. Because if someone, this anecdote was my favorite, someone bought a new espresso maker and that actually tripped, uh, that, that created a fault because it wasn't, no, they weren't expecting that load to be on the system at that time. So that, Looking in places, those com communities of that, that size, you can really see how they've adjusted. Because it depends point when it's a bit, to, to, it's when it's a larger community, all that's kind of statistical error. But those smaller places, you can really dig into what they've done differently. And I think another good example is Greensburg. I mentioned Greensburg already, but Greensburg, 90% of the building stock was wiped out by a, the equivalent of a Category 5 tornado. They use different terminology, but. Um, and they decided that they, rather than just disperse, they all wanted to reestablish the community. So they set up, um, they had the first lead platinum community center in the country and 
first lead certified town or something to that effect. They built, rebuilt efficiently to begin with, and they put a bunch of renewables nearby. They buy wrecks off the larger grid, so they are cheating to get the last couple of percentage points, but they are 100% renewable at this point. Um, but the, what, they, what they did as far as planning the rebuild of their entire community, how they did that, um, the small business incubator, the renewable energy, the community center, revitalizing their own, re, like rebuilding and revitalizing Main Street. All of that, those, we have some of those stories out there, but that's another good place to, to look to if you're trying to articulate some of those things. Uh, and are you familiar with the island playbook? If you're not, yeah. this island playbook, at least the front end of it, really talks about how you understand your load and communicate some of that information on these types of systems. Yes, now we can. I think we're, we have a lot to, to probably have our gate in the too, where we want to be tied to the grid, because the grid, when the, when the Bay Area grid is the greenest, and going our grid, and the grid when it's all right now on the crystal canoe. So the control system starts to get a bit more complex when we're taking the input from, from the utility grid. Do you guys have any good examples of grid operation systems, operating systems? Um, my question is, how do you go from you know, experienced grid operators to folks that haven't operated with grid before and may have to make some pretty, some pretty difficult decisions? How do, you, how do we make those decisions easier? And do you guys have examples of user-friendly <laughs> interface systems? So there are, there are a number of companies that are working in kind of microgrid controllers. There's actually two IEEE standards, IEEE 2030.7 and 0.8, that are around microgrid controllers to try to standardize some of that functionality. Again, like I was saying before, everything's custom. Even the controllers are custom, which, which makes it very difficult to even transition. You know, you learned how to try to run this one microgrid. Now, now it's a different system operating a different microgrid. Um, so there's been some work on standardizing those controllers. There's been a couple of competitions over the last couple of years that have evaluated a variety of different controllers that are out there on the marketplace right now. Um, so there is reports and information on some of those. But again, you're still stuck in a, a custom world uh, a lot of times when we see these microgrid controllers, they're the first version of it, right? So even if you train up people, then uh, if they may get a new version coming out within a year that it may look a lot different. So unfortunately, I think we're still in the infancy on microgrid controllers and there's not a nice way that it plugs in nicely with some other part of the distribution management systems that are available. Uh, we have some test beds set up at the national labs at where, where people can evaluate these. But again, we, we're setting up the test beds because they're so new technology-wise. It's not like a standard commercial product that you go buy microgrid controller X and, and it's deployed everywhere uh, that you see a microgrid. So unfortunately, I'd say right now, you're still in the infancy on standardizing controllers. And then there's a lot of customization on the design and the different parts of the microgrid that would actually be used, like the switch that, that goes between it and the grid and all the controllers for the embedded generation. There's not a nice uh, standardized package in there. Sorry. <laughs> there's, I mean, there, there, are, there are companies that, that put out products. Um, right now you're still, though, in the stage where they don't even have enough out there that you can verify in the field that, that there's a lot of experience with them. Uh, Jack Wadsworth again. I um, am really surprised that there's any conversation at all about uh, microgrids incorporating uh, hydrocarbon-based energy generation. Uh, I can well imagine that that's a part of the last hundred years, but uh, you know, here we are in an era where alternative energy is competitive. Uh, 
And uh, going forward, it seems to me that uh, uh, the whole story, you know, must eventually be about uh, distributed energy generation to eliminate transmission and uh, zero carbon emissions to deal with the atmosphere. And that that is what the microgrid really promises. Uh, so, I mean, maybe that's in everybody's head, but it seems to me to talk about creating a microgrid today that doesn't reach for those kinds of outcomes uh, kind of, you know, is uh, a question of, you know, why are we here? I would say in general, most people are thinking of those as eventual outcomes. But if you look at the economics of providing power to any remote village, these are remote places where you're not going to bring anything else on site. Uh, diesel. Yeah, I'm thinking about urban. Yeah, so I mean, urban. So what? <laughs> well, there are people that care about remote systems, yeah, right. and, and diesel still is cost effective for those. If you look at urban systems, um, you still have a you still are then competing with the price of electricity. So the price of electricity dictates you know, how much you're willing to add in additional renewables to create a microgrid. Because to, to do that, you're going to have to add energy storage plus renewables. And if you look at the cost of those right now, it's, it's getting much more competitive to come in and do one of those types of systems. But then, what, you know, you're still designing around cases where I you I think an important part of the economic model is to look forward and use discounted cash flow and make some assumptions about where the cost is going. Yeah. I think it's up to the commercial industries to be providing systems that cost are cost competitive with the cost of electricity. So where you see high prices of electricity, big urban centers on the East Coast, uh, California, that's where you're starting to see these systems go in. So, And to, so, to follow on, I think eventually is the key word in, in both of your statements. Um, right now it's, you know, We're, we're looking at infrastructure where it is. Uh, just one example from very recent memory, there is an industrial facility on a steep slope that, does, that has, does, doesn't have wind and doesn't have the slope it needs for solar, isn't close to geothermal, isn't close to hydro, is where it is because it needs the very clean well water that's in, that, in the mountain that it's based on. And so the question is, where, how do you design a microgrid for that customer? You can, if at the end of the day, they need to make sure that they run, they can't count on a transmission line failing, they can't count on the distribution system failing, they want stuff that's as close to them as possible, and the renewables simply are not there, then a mixed fuel portfolio is the best, is the most optimal. But I do think as the, as you both pointed out already, the cost changes. And if we see the trends that Eric pointed out continue the way that they're going, I, I don't think the economic justification, I think the economics will play out and everyone will get to the answer you're talking about. But for the time being, we're not, we, that's not reality. It will be, maybe. Um, but there will still be some customers that are not Neat, close enough to renewable resources that might drive them to look to the energy stored in hydrocarbons as a fuel source. Great, thanks. Um, due to interest of time, let me cut the conversation here. Um, the panelists will be here for the coffee break, and we have uh, until eleven twenty. Yeah. So, uh, we'll, we'll snack our. Uh